Amen. Amen. Great job, band. I think it's cool this morning that 50% of our band, high school students. I think that's amazing. And, uh, and I think they are amazing. So there you go. There's that. Welcome to Arrow Church. My name is Robert. I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad that you guys are here. And if we had not had a chance to meet yet, I would love to before you leave and just say hi and get to know a little bit more about you. Uh, we are a church where everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect, and with Jesus, anything is possible. Uh, like I said last week, we are a church of broken people. Uh, but here's the, tr- here's the trick. Every church that you'll ever go to is a church of broken people. Uh, we just brag about it on our banners. And so, uh, man, we're so glad that you guys are here. Uh, I want to bring somebody up this morning who, without this person... Everything we do here does not happen, okay? And you're thinking, he's bringing God up here? No, no, no. Like, like, yes, God is the reason all this happens. But physically, there is a person who, uh, without this, Arrows Church does not meet on Sunday mornings. And so I want to introduce you guys to Mike Mason. Mike, come on up here, buddy. Uh. You're not going to have to say much. I just want you, check, check. I don't know who's mic. There you go. I just want you, what is your official title, by the way? I am a custodian. A custodian. (laughs) A custodian. You say that all nonchalantly, like it's not the awesome awesome thing you do, so. It has its days. There is really good days, and there is really bad days. Yeah. It just depends on how you take it and what goes on in the building, and what kind of staff that you have to work with. I believe that. I believe that. Well, Mike gets here uh, like 6.45, 6.30. I don't know when he gets here. He unlocks the doors. He opens all the, the places for us. He turns the lights on, and he literally makes this, it possible for us to be in this building. And so, man, thank you so much just for week after week after week, just faithfully. I put a picture up here of you by the way. Yeah. Um, so a little birdie, a little birdie told us that um, you didn't actually have a Bible of your own. And so one of our lovely Eros Church people, they, they got you a Bible. And it's a really nice Bible, by the way. And you can see in here that we all, we all signed it for you, just to, just to say thanks. And so, man, we really do appreciate everything you do and uh, we're proud of you, and, and we're glad that you're, you're around Eros Church. So I'm going to give you that. Thanks, if, yeah, man. If you see Mike, if you see Mike, give him a high five. Tell him thank you. Appreciate everything you do. Yeah, he gets, uh, he gets all, the, all the work and none of the glory there, and so... Uh, yeah, he does a whole lot for us, and we're super excited for him. We've been, we've been challenging all you guys to consider serving over the last few weeks just because it's that time of year where people are out a lot. And so I, really, I just want to reiterate, we do uh, would love for you guys to serve regularly, maybe find a way to, to partner with us financially regularly, and uh, those, that could not be easier to start those. So if you just want to fill out that card, next step card, if you want to scan that QR code, we tried to make it as simple as possible for you to begin that process of helping us out. Let me open us up in prayer this morning. God, we celebrate everything that you have already done. God, we, we, we sang that already, what you've done. And you've done so much for so many of us, and we don't want to neglect that. We want to be able to come in here and praise you for that. No matter what's going on today, The truth is you have done some amazing things, and we want to celebrate that and honor you for that. Be with now as we we look into your word. Speak to us and reveal your word to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we we just started this series on Galatians a couple of weeks ago, and we've kind of only gone through the first chapter. So let me just give you a quick summary. So the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the churches of Galatia, which he helped start. And he's writing to them because what, it, what was happening is these new Jewish believers were coming out of Jerusalem into the surrounding areas. 
and they were bringing with them all of their Jewish traditions and requirements and laws and everything, and they were telling these new Gentile non-Jewish believers, hey, your faith is incomplete because you need to be circumcised, you need to do this, you need to follow this dietary restriction, you need to do that and that. And Paul hears about this, and he's like, oh, man, like, why they got to go mess everything up? And so he sits down and he writes Galatians to all of these churches to kind of help get them back to what he wanted them to say. We're going to talk about grace today. We're talking about grace and what it means. And it's one of these words that we all use, everyone has heard of, but few people really know what it means. You could ask many people, like, hey, define grace. And some people may say, oh, grace, that's like when you're kind to other people, when you show kindness to someone. Well, not really. We have a word for that. It's called kindness. It's not really grace. Oh, grace is when someone just carries themselves with elegance. We would say that they're graceful, right? Well, no, not really. That's elegant. Or, or oh, a grace is, is like mercy. It's when you don't give somebody something that they deserve. Well, not really. That's when you're merciful to them. And so grace, in terms of how the Bible understands the word, is grace is unmerited, in other words, unearned favor. It's when we are given a gift freely that we don't deserve, that we can't pay for, that we don't have any means to, in order to receive it. Like, like we didn't do anything to receive this gift, it's just freely given to us. That's grace. That's the, the way grace, the Bible defines grace. And Paul is upset that these Galatians were adding things to their faith, like all these laws and restrictions and things like that. Because once you start to add something to the grace that has been given to you freely, it ceases to be grace. And it starts to be a a reward. It starts to be something that you've earned, a wage in a sense. Like you worked for it, so here you go. And, and Paul, that's why he's so upset that they're adding stuff to this faith. If you've ever seen grace in action, if you've ever actually seen it, my, my guess is you remember seeing it. Because it's so not how this world is set up to operate. It is so not how we typically act with one another. So when we see it, it stands out as otherworldly. Like it's like, oh, what is that? Like, like a like a bright, colorful thing in, in just in the midst of grayness. It stands out, and we recognize it. We're going to look at an example of grace today. Paul is continuing on his story. So he comes out hard, chapter 1, verse 1. He comes out, like, really hard, and then he backs up a little bit, and he's like, let me tell you a story about a time that Jesus completely totaled my life. That's what we talked about last week. And so he's kind of carrying on that story when we pick up in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, so let's, let's pick it up. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. So 14 years later, Paul's telling the story, and he's like, 14 years after I met Jesus, the encounter that Paul had with Jesus on the way to Damascus, where Jesus shows up and the bright light shines and it knocks Paul off of his horse and literally blinds him. 14 years after that, Paul's picking up the story. So what, he, what has he been doing for the last 14 years? He's been preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. Remember, his life was completely totaled, flipped upside down. So he's been going around starting all these churches, on these missionary journeys, just telling people, particularly the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jewish Jewish people, about Jesus. And get this, they believed him. And they believed in Jesus, and they were coming to faith, and they were starting churches, and and, and the gospel was spreading. So this is what Paul has been doing for the last 14 years. And then he goes to Jerusalem, because really Jesus had kind of revealed to him, you need to go to Jerusalem. He hadn't really spent any time with these church officials yet. The church of Jerusalem, 
the, the leadership. In other words, Paul goes to the principal's office. What, what, what Vatican City in Rome is to the Catholic faith, the church in Jerusalem was to early Christianity. And so Paul, he's been kind of doing his own thing out here, he goes to the principal's office. And, and, here, and we see grace when he does this. When he gets there, he sort of shows up and is like, well, hey guys, it's me, that guy Paul that I'm sure you've heard of by now. I'm the guy that used to hate you. I'm the guy that used to uh, arrest Christians, go after Christians, harm Christians, do everything I could do to destroy the church. Yeah, that's me. I met Jesus, kind of changed my life, and I've been going around telling people about him for the last 14 years. But notice, when he gets there, he doesn't, go, he doesn't present himself to the whole assembly. Paul doesn't walk in the room, come up here up front, and speak to everyone. It says he goes in private to those who seem to be in leadership. Paul shows up in Jerusalem and pulls a Karen. He just rolls up and he's like, eh, yeah, I'd like to speak to your manager, please. i like a request for redirect. Like he just goes in and just goes straight to who he thinks, who he seems, who it looks like is, is in charge here. And he goes to them in private and has a great conversation. I think this shows great humility on Paul's part to submit to this church leadership in this way. Why? Because he doesn't have to. He didn't have to. He got his charge from Jesus Christ himself, who said, go preach my name to the Gentiles. And that's what he did. And that's what he's been doing for the last 14 years. But yet, because he felt like Jesus was saying, hey, you should go to Jerusalem, he goes to Jerusalem and, and puts himself under submission and authority of these church leaders. And I wonder, what would this world look like if people did this on a regular basis? If they put themselves under the authority and submission of someone else? What would our world look like? What would our marriages look like? If it wasn't just the husband saying, you need to submit to me, because that's what the Bible says. But if husbands would place themselves under the submission of their spouse, and wives place themselves under submission of their spouse, a mutual submission. What would your life look differently if you had someone or a group of people that you submitted to in authority and humility so that when they said, you should do this, you do it. And when they said, you shouldn't do this, you don't do it. And here's the cheat code. Submission is not submission until it feels like submission. You know what I mean? We've all been there. Like you're, you're a kid, right? And your mom's like, get in there and clean those dishes. You're like, I don't want to clean those dishes. And you're in there and you're like splashing water everywhere and slamming doors. But what are you doing? You're cleaning those dishes, aren't you? Right? Submission is not, oh, you're my commanding officer, so I have to do what you say. Submission is not, oh, you're my boss. I literally get paid to listen to you, so I'm going to listen to you. That's not submission. Submission isn't submission until it feels like submission. When it's like, Mm. I want to do this, but these really smart people that I've let into my life are telling me that might not be a good idea, and so maybe I'm not going to do this. That's submission. Galatians chapter 2, verse 3. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. One of the main issues at hand was whether or not these new Gentile believers should be circumcised. Because these Jewish faithful new believers were coming in and being like, yeah, man, you need to be circumcised. We're all circumcised because circumcision is a sign that you are in covenant with God. It's been that way forever. It's a sign that God made to Abraham that I will bless you and bless your descendants, and this is how we'll know, right? And they're like, unless you're, unless you're circumcised, you don't, really, you don't really know that you're in the covenant. And Paul hears of this, and he's like, oh, circumcision is an outward sign. It's not what saves you. You want to circumcise something? Cut your heart open. 
Cut away the dead flesh that is your heart and let Jesus put a new heart in you. That's what saves you. And so the, this was going on, and he's like, we didn't fall for it. Titus didn't fall for it. Titus was straight up Greek. He wasn't Jewish at all. Verse 6, as for those who seemed to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. I love that Paul is like, I walked in this room, I met with these seemed leaders privately, and there were some big players in there. There were some heavy hitters, and I didn't care. I didn't care who was in that room. Like, and we see this before in Paul, we see this before, but he's like, I don't care. And my question to you is, and just be honest, how many of you, like when you meet someone famous, or, or maybe even locally famous, you get all giddy? Yeah. I, okay. I th- okay, 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 come on. I know for a fact, if like Taylor Swift walked through those doors, some of you would freak out, okay? Thank you, Don. Thank you. Yeah, I'd freak out. What's up? Right? Um, when I was in high school, I worked at a country club, that, a golf course, and my role was basically to do all the things that nobody else wanted to do. So I took care of the carts and cleaned them and got them where they needed to be and, and worked the range and picked up all the range balls and put the stanchion markers out and I did all the things, right? And I'd, I would also work tournaments. And uh, so we'd help people get to where they need to be. So I remember one day, it's like a Saturday, we're doing this golf tournament, I'm out there, and uh, we, the, when the players drive in, we go out there and meet them, we get them, uh, get their bag and everything. So I'm sitting there, and I see a player drive up and park, so I jump in a cart, drive out, meet him, he, op- he pops the trunk, I grab his bag, put his bag in there, get it strapped in, all the things. He gets out, and he, he extends his hand to me, and he's like, how you doing today? My name's Dave Marr. And I'm like, I could tell by the way he said it that he thought it was important. You ever been in a conversation like that? I could tell by the way he said it that he thought I should think it was important. But I'm like, hey, Dave, my name's Robert. Nice to meet you. I mean, that was like, okay. And so I I get his bag and everything going. Here's where you need to be. And I send him on his way. And then I walk back to the clubhouse I get to the clubhouse, and all the golf pros are in there. These are the guys that actually ran things but didn't do anything. And so uh, they're like, hey, so which player showed up? I'm like, I don't know, Dave Marr or something like that. Dave Marr! And they freak out. And all of them just, like, run out of the clubhouse into the parking lot chasing this guy down. And I'm like, what in the world? Come to find out, this guy had won a PGA championship, and he was a golf analyst for ABC for like 20 years. He was incredibly locally famous, at least in Houston. And I remember thinking, even as a teenager, watching these grown men wet themselves over this guy, I remember thinking, no, nobody deserves that except Jesus, maybe. Like, are you kidding me? I'm not going to go all crazy over somebody like that. And that's what Paul is saying here. He said, hey, there were some heavy hitters in this room, but we've already heard from Paul on this, haven't we? Chapter 1, verse 10, he says, am I trying to win the approval of God or am I trying to win the approval of man? Because if I'm trying to win man's approval, I cannot be a servant of Christ. And so my only goal is to win the approval of God. And guess what? I already have it. That's what Paul says. And so we, we, we get to see how Paul reacts in the presence of greatness. He was not impressed by those who were impressive. Paul was not impressed by those who were impressive. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, pick it up in verse 7. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. Verse 9, James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked is that we continue to remember the poor the very thing which I was eager to do. We see in these verses who those supposed big hitters were. It was James, Peter, and John. Like, 
the disciples. Like if there was a, an A team of disciples, it was these guys. These are the guys who literally spent every day with Jesus. No wonder everyone else thought that they were amazing. And Paul's like, hey, what's up? I heard of you. How's it going? How's that ministry to the Jews going? Because I've been slugging it away out here with the Gentiles, right? Like, like he just sees them, and we see, oh, man, like Paul could have been just enamored with them. But they, having seen the grace given to Paul, they extend what the Bible says, the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they welcome. Everyone's welcome. They welcomed him in because they could not deny the fact that this guy is telling the truth. We see it. We see it. Remember, these disciples had hung out with Jesus. They had seen firsthand how Jesus extended grace to everyone he met. And when you see that over and over again, firsthand, you learn to recognize it. And you learn to recognize it when you see it in other people. And they see Paul, and they hear of Paul's stories, and they're like, this is it. This is the real thing. This is what we saw in Jesus. This looks familiar. We recognize this grace. In our culture, unfortunately, we extend the right hand of fellowship to those that agree with us. We extend the, the right hand of fellowship when we say, oh, do you believe what I believe? Well, then you're welcome here. Oh, do you, do you uh, like the same things that I like? Well, then, then we can be friends. Do you vote the same way that I vote? Well, then we can have fellowship. But here, they don't base their welcoming on anything other than the grace that they see in Paul. And this ability to see grace will affect everything in our lives. It will affect how we spend our time, where we spend our money, how we pray, which church we go to, how we assess our own spiritual health, how we parent our kids, even how we make difficult decisions and, and resolve conflicts. Seeing grace, the ability to see grace, is an essential life skill for anybody wanting to live a gospel-centered life. The ability to see grace, which brings up the question. How do we see grace? How, do we, how are we able to recognize grace when we see it? Two things. Number one, is the gospel changing lives? Do you see the gospel changing lives? We know it's true grace where we find a faithful sharing of the gospel paired with a believing response of the gospel. They heard the gospel, they believed it, and something is different now. When we see that, that is true grace. Are people's lives really changing? Are they growing in their faith? Are they picking up their Bible and reading it? Are they praying about things they haven't prayed about before? Are they showing humility towards their spouse and towards their children? Are they less of a jerk and more like Jesus today than they were yesterday and the year before? Can we see change in their life? This is what the Jerusalem leaders saw in Paul. Verse 7, remember it said, they saw that, it, uh, that what had been entrusted with the task of preaching, sorry, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel just as Peter had been. They didn't question Peter's leadership. Nobody was like, now, tell, okay, Peter, like you were with Jesus, probably his right-hand guy. How do we know you're really supposed to be going after the, nobody did that. And when they saw Paul, they realized, we don't need to be questioning this guy at all either. He's got the same authority and, and really the same conviction and, and, and influence that Peter has, but just to the Gentiles. And even though it might not have been 100% clear to the Jewish leaders, Paul brought a show and tell. He brought Titus. Remember, Titus was Greek, the opposite of Jewish. And Titus shows up. Finally, in the back, and he's like, hey, I'm Titus. I, I don't, I'm not Jewish at all. I don't know anything about your traditions. All I know is that I heard the gospel from this guy, and he's telling the truth. He's the real deal. I've seen it in him, and now I see it in myself. I didn't know Jesus. I know Jesus now, and it's all because of this guy. Can you imagine the influence, the impact that that would have had on those, on those leaders at that point? And they're like, well, I mean, he brought a show and tell, like, how can we deny that what he is saying is true? When it comes to seeing grace, the proof is in the pudding. And in this case, the pudding is the people. 
Can we see people's lives change? I love that we have people serving here at Arrows Church that, have, that are serving in a capacity that they have never served in before. In fact, just to show a hand, if you are serving in a capacity here at Arrows Church that you have not served in before, just lift your hand up. Yeah, look at that. Isn't that awesome? I'm assuming for those of you that did not raise your hand, you're saying you can do more. Did we get those names, Angie? Did you write those down? Yeah, don't worry. We're going to contact you. It's going to be great, okay? Uh, it's not that you've never had the opportunity to serve in that capacity, is it? It's the fact that for whatever reason God has impressed on you, hey, for this season, for this moment in your life, I want you to serve in this capacity for Arrows Church. Why? Because the gospel is changing you. It's changing you. If I could just highlight a couple of people, they don't know I'm going to do this, but I just want to do it. Uh, Sam and Nick, can you guys raise your hands? So Sam and Nick, last week, two weeks ago, um, we had our scuba wall in our, in our Arrows Kids and if you were in there, you know it didn't go all the way down the floor and all that kind of stuff. We needed more, so we bought a new wall, but we had to individually take the magnets off of the old one and put them on the new one. Kind of a, just a tedious process, and I don't know how many there were. Did we ever figure out how many there were? Yeah, a lot. A lot. Sam and Nick came to me, and they were like, hey, can we, can we take those old ones home and, and let us put the new ones on there? And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, but you're going to need help. Like, that's a lot of magnets. And they're like, no, no, no. Like, you guys don't understand. They were like, let us do this. Like, we want to do this. And, and they came, and they got the old ones, and they got the new ones, and they exchanged them out, and they did it all themselves. And it's amazing. If you haven't seen the new walls, go down and check out Arrows Kids. It's really cool. But here's my question to you, if you guys would be willing to answer this. Is that something you would have done two years ago? A year ago, even, maybe? Why? The why? I'll answer it for you. The gospel is changing you. We, we see changed lives when we see the gospel show up. So the second way we see it is are people making sacrifices? When people make sacrifices for the kingdom of God, we see a grace that goes from just being able to see it to being able to touch it. Like when people start making sacrifices for the kingdom, that grace that was only visible before becomes 3D. It becomes tangible. It becomes in color. It, uh, like we can see it and smell it and taste it and all the things. It's like that's the grace when we see people making sacrifices. The Jewish leaders saw this same type of sacrifice when Paul showed up because he literally brought a bag full of grace. And dropped it at their feet. He brought money. Let me give you a context of what's going on. In case you think, oh, is he trying to pay them off or something? Uh, two things were happening in Jerusalem at the time. Number one is Christianity was not really popular. They were being persecuted. Jesus had died, right? They were just kind of doing their best to get things going. People were coming after them left and right like Paul had previously. And because of that, the church was having to spread out away from Jerusalem, mainly because that's what God wanted. God wanted the, the church to spread out. That's literally why we're here today, because it did spread out. The second thing that was going on is there was a big famine in the area at the time. Like it was real and people were struggling. Now guess who is at the bottom of that ladder of importance when it comes to who gets food and, and rations and all that kind of thing? Christians that nobody wanted there anyway. They're at the bottom of the important list. So what Paul had been doing for the last several years, as he's going around to all these churches, building them up, strengthening them up, reminding them about the faith, he's been taking up a, a love offering for the church of Jerusalem. You can read about it in Scripture. Every church he goes, he's like, now let's take up a love offering for our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who are having to deal with a lot of stuff that we're not having to deal with, and they, were, they would give. So Paul shows up to Jerusalem, and he's like, oh, uh, as if Titus, my first show and tell, wasn't enough, thunk, throws down this big bag of money, and he's like, uh, I've been going around to all these Gentile churches that I started, and they'd love to be here, but they can't be here. But they're sending their love. They want you to know they're praying for you. God bless. And boom, just gives them this money. Like, can you imagine how that would have impacted the Jewish leaders? 
Because if Paul was speaking poorly about them to anyone, how in the world is he going to raise that money? So this was testimony to them that this guy is clearly in support of what we're doing because he's able to raise money from people that don't even know us to support us. And so they see this in Paul, and they're just blown away. Generous giving, guys, when it's done to the glory of God, shines a light on God's grace. Giving generously when it's done for the glory of God. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is there is a wrong way to give. There is. You could give like the Pharisees gave and be like, hey, everybody, I'm just going to give over there just so everybody can see how much I'm giving. Aren't I great? Because I gave, right? Like there's a wrong way to give. But when we give generously for God's glory, it, it, it's like a flashlight that shines the light on this grace, and everyone can see it clearly. So that's how we see grace. Let me ask you this. Where do we see grace? Where do we see grace? A lot of people think that church, that what we're doing right here, is the only time we can see God's grace. And they're like, oh, it makes sense. You go to church, you see God's grace. But is God's grace selective about when and where it shows up? Is it like my dog, Chewy, who loves to lay in the warm places of our house? And uh, if you have a little dog like this, maybe you understand, he just, he'll follow the sun around in the house and he'll lay wherever the sun is, even, it's, even if it's on the top of our dining table. This dog, I think it, it's, a, it's a freak of nature. I think it's a cat. It just looks like a dog. I think that's pretty much what we've come to the conclusion on. Is God's grace like that? Is God's grace selective on where it shows up? Does God's grace have seasons? Does God's grace show up less in the wintertime because the sunshine shines through the window less? Or at a steeper angle? Does God's grace show up more in the summer because there's just more of it during the day? Is God's grace selective on where and when it shows up? Some people think that God's grace only appears during those sunny, cheery times of life. Others think that God's grace will only show up after they do all that they can do to earn God's grace. I've got to clean myself up. I've got to get rid of all this sin in my life, and then God's grace can show up in my life. Well, let me ask you this. How's that working for you? Are, are, are you doing well at that? Like, did you clean it all up? Did, did you get past it? My guess is you haven't, and you didn't. I get the opportunity to see the privilege of seeing grace in, in tons of places, being a pastor of a church. The truth that I'm trying to say is this. Since God is everywhere, God's grace is everywhere. If God is everywhere, then we know that God's grace is everywhere. I get to see it all the time. I get to see it all week long. I get to see, uh, uh, yes, the grace that God bestows on us because of what we do here. But I also get to see it when I see a parent baptize their child. I get to see it when I see a person who's battling against some tremendous temptation. And, and maybe, maybe they fail, but maybe they also succeed at times too. I get to see it when I see a spouse who's struggling to persevere in a very difficult marriage or maybe even a difficult divorce. And I get to see it when I see a person hanging on to Jesus even in the middle of an illness that is sucking the life out of them. And they have no reason to lift their hand to God in praise, but they do, and you can't take it away. Because God is everywhere, God's grace is everywhere. And the absolute best place we can see the grace of God is on the cross that Jesus died on for us. And I would argue this, Unless you can clearly see the grace that came through the cross of Jesus, you cannot see God's grace anywhere else. You won't. You'll see other things and you'll think it's grace, 
But all it is is kindness. All it is is elegance. All it is is mercy. But it's not grace. Why? You don't understand grace. The only way we can understand grace is to see it clearly by what Jesus did on the cross for us. And get this. Here's my, here's my challenge. I know a lot of you guys, you grew up in the church, you're familiar with church, if nothing else. And maybe you even believe wholeheartedly that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sin. You believe that. My question is, do you believe it's true for you? Have you ever personally accepted that grace? Not that you believe that it happened. Fine, it happened. Do you believe it happened for you? That Jesus died on that cross for you. And have you ever said, God, I, Robert, me, I accept that gift of grace that you have for me. Not just that it was for everybody. I accept it for me, personally. Insert your name there. For God so loved you that he gave his son. If you want to accept that, you can. Just fill out that card, that Next Steps card, and just mark on there, I want to follow Jesus. Tell me how to do that. Put it in the box. Give it to me, however you can get it to us. Guys, God's grace is is very much real. And because God is everywhere, His grace is everywhere. When you see it, you know it. Because it stands out. But the only way you can see it is if you understand the original God's grace and that's how Jesus gave his life for us let me pray for us God we thank you that not one person in this room is awesome enough to earn a relationship with you I mean some of us are okay some of us are Terrific. Some of us have good days. Some of us have bad days. But it doesn't matter because not one, not, not any one of us, not any one of us have done anything worthy to where you would want to have a relationship with us on our own. You chose to have a relationship with us. And that's why we can. That's why we do. You chose to partner with me You saw me before I was born. You knit me in my mother's womb, knowing that one of these days you were going to use me to speak for your glory. I didn't know that. I didn't know that for a long time. But you did. And God, you know each and every one of us in that same way. And you know what you want each and every one of us to do. God, the first step, the first step that we all need to take just receive that grace and say, I believe that Jesus died for me. And because he did, my life can be total. It can look completely different. People won't recognize me. I'm not going to be perfect. You never ask for perfection. God, you ask for humility and obedience and trust and faith love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These are the things that should be in our life and other people should be able to see them. God, help us. Help us all do what we can do to honor the gift of grace that you've given us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.